there's a, a saying in the audio community, so when you're interviewing someone, if at any point they vocalise during the interview, it's a yes. You, you don't like it, but you know, you know. They do that, you're like, that's it, that's what we need. We need someone who's still got that little bit of seven-year-old in them that knows what stuff to sound like. So real rally cars are crazy, they're crazy loud. No one near as loud as the backfire. The backfire is hundreds of times louder than the engine. There's no way we can do that on a computer screen. So a lot of what we were doing was not making it sound as it should sound, but making it sound as you think it should sound. So on Operation Flashpoint, you know when you put a, a pair of goggles on, night vision goggles, they go Mee! No they don't. No they don't. You'd get shot if they did that. No night goggles have ever done this, ever. But we all know that they do. And there was a big discussion on that one going, do we go with what everyone thinks it should do, which is wrong, or, or do we be right? And everyone goes, well, why isn't it making a noise? In the end, I think we did, but we made it very quiet because we knew that it would be, we can't win, there's no win scenario. So we would always make sure stuff sounded as we thought it should sound. So Burnout's crashes were partly a huge technical achievement. So the PlayStation 2 has, well, Burnout shipped with 72 seconds of audio. And that's it. That's all we can fit in around, 72 seconds. That has to cover everything. Streaming buffers for music, every crash, every skid, every engine, every hug up, that's it. 72 seconds. You, you cannot break that. So we immediately wrecked that ways to break it. So in Burnout, when you crash, there is a, I think it's a three second window before you can crash again. And that three second, I chuck away all the crash audio and pull in a variant and yank it in. And I have three seconds to get that off disc while streaming the music, while streaming the track. So we shove that back in. So when you crash in Burnout, every time you crash, it sounds different. Every crash has a, it's a pack of about 30 seconds of audio. And we would stream specific slow-mo and fast audio. And so there was there's some real technical pushes on that. Nowadays, you just know the crap. Oh no, it's 50 megs. Whatever. And this one we had two megs. And we couldn't ask for more. That was it. It was physically two megabytes of RAM. But I remember the first time I took a build home from Burnout 3. Because one of our goals was to properly master the game. So the engine audio was the equivalent of speaking in a film, which is minus 18 dB. The crashes were at zero. And I got it home, crank out, broke around, this is great, and I crashed for the first time, and my house shakes. And I'm like, <gasps> like the neighbors, the neighbors must think I've just, I don't know, exploded a bomb. It was so and I went to bed and I went, 18 dB is cool. Quite a jump. So that's a quiet bit of a film, and someone's like, oh, come in, Dr. Gerald, come in. To the bit where there's a nuclear explosion, and that was driving to crashing, so burnout properly. Probably sort of, we were one of the first to really do dynamic rain. We, it was a fight. It, the games get louder and louder, 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 louder and louder, and then they bring it down. Oh, climax, and at one point, the guy gets one of the producers, can you turn down the engines and the crowds and the skit and like, there's a button on the, oh, sorry, I get the button on the television for this. Because he was listening to it like three volume on the television, going, I can't, I can't hear it. I'm like, yeah, but you have to crank it up like you would at home. Where it goes, well, everyone else will be get annoyed. I'm like, well, then maybe we need a room to, to listen to this in. And Black, on Black we got one of the few games where the audio was genuinely talked about a lot. And a lot of that was down to one very clever trick, which I will share with you. When we demonstrated this gunplay game, we only demonstrated at gun volume. So at um, shows, we had a room, soundproof, massive blue skies crank, that loud. There was no talking while you were playing the game. There was no going, wow, this is great. You were immersed in huge screen, blastingly loud audio, probably, probably too loud, but they come out going, that's really amazing, that sounds so good. And I'm like, it does. Mostly it's loud, you can't tell the difference. And I found that, it, it's, it, it really, really worked, it really, really did. And it was, it, said, it was weird because I had demonstrated other games to people, just so quiet that I didn't disturb people. And uh, that was always uh, a nightmare. Sumo's brilliant approach that we had, a sap you can buy little soundproof sheds. So there's a soundproof shed on the ground floor in the, work, like, in the workplace of Sumo. So I just basically spent my days in a shed in the middle of a big car room full of people working away. So that's how they approach being able to listen to stuff quite loudly. I was the only audio programmer on three projects. We had an external guy who was atrocious. He would do audio. So I said to him, can I get a sound of a turbocharger? And he sent me this sound and I went, 
what's this? He goes, oh, it's a boat out of water sped up. I'm like, well, that's not what a turbocharger sounds like. So uh, this is the very early, early, early days of uh, the internet. There's no YouTube. So I was finding like random mob files of jet planes landing, getting a bit of that, filtering it. There's the turbo noise. And I've got the email somewhere because someone, I said, I can't get these recordings of things like transmission wine and skids. I, I can't, I, you know, I, I don't have it. Um, so I nicked them out of Colin McRae 5. And I said, it's just a zip file. And I said, they said, we'll do that. And I said, I need an email from you telling me to do this. There is no way I'm doing it off my own back. And that was Rally Masters too. When I went to work for Codemaster, they went, yeah, we noticed. And if the game had sold at all well, we were coming after you, but it didn't. So we didn't bother. Code Criterion was a, a bigger studio in that sense. We were very weirdly owned by Canon you know, cameras and photographs, don't know why, and eventually got sold to EA. But when I joined Criterion, I was the junior underneath Alistair, who was the lead programmer. There were two audio programmers on Burnout. Uh, we then had Ben Minto and Steve Root doing the, uh, they were looking after the design side of things. But we had the Europe's first custom design 5.1 studio. So, you know, special shape, um, the usual uh, instructions to the, the builders. Don't level the walls. They're a couple of degrees off on purpose. So you don't get this side back and forwards. And that was a lot better company because they were a bit more grown up. So in most on at Climax, we did MotoGP, which had surround sound. Because the Xbox has got five one surround. It's the OG Xbox. And I had to go into one of the cleaning cupboards and set up the five one speakers because there was nowhere to do it. Whereas at Criterion, we had our we had a sound studio. It Codemasters because I was a lot more senior. I said I need a roof. And I, I had one of the meeting rooms for a longest time. And it wasn't great, but I put posters up on the glass so it wasn't reflecting back. Which I get that you need to take those down so you can see and I'm like, it's not here because I'm gonna hide. I don't want a panels of glass reflecting stuff back. Um, and over the years we progressed more and more at Codemasters and we came up with a lot more uh, of a grown-up sort of setup. You know, we had we'd have the lead audio designer, the lead audio programmer, they'd have juniors, we would outsource stuff a lot, and we had proper dedicated rooms, we had proper recording rooms, we had proper rooms to demonstrate it. It worked really, really well. But it, it, that was me, I mean, the industry I think grew up with, it wasn't me that did that, but it was, yeah, that's a 10 year sort of uh, time frame. The industry itself was growing up, realizing that it's not just, you know, one bloke who goes, oh, I can, I can play the piano, I can you know, do your audio for you. Um, so Criterion, as I said, Criterion was the first studio I'm aware of um, that had a, five, a dedicated 5.1 studio, designed for 5.1. We were also one of the part, real pioneers in ProLogic 2. So ProLogic 2, I don't remember in ProLogic 1, I can't remember. ProLogic 2 works by inverting the phase on one of the channels. So if you play the same sound effect on the left and the right, but the phase is inverted, it comes pan for the back, and the phase is the same, it comes to the front. But this leads to the most bizarre sound when something goes right through you and it doesn't work. So we were developing bubbles where from above, this, you know, you've got two cars and uh, one's here like this, a car goes past. So you want to go front to back. You can't do that. So the sound effect would have to do this sort of bubble sound. So we'd have to push bubbles out around. And we were a ProLogic 2 certified game and there weren't very many of those. And th but this PlayStation had no concept of surround sound. The Xbox did discrete five one channels, and that was brilliant, and it was good, and we were so proud. We had this great setup, and we had this huge mixing desk, uh, which we never used, but all fancy lights, had a button that made everything animate, and we had this great studio, and it was what you know, with proper kit. Dolby Atmos is, is great, and uh, hopefully that's here to stay, and hopefully we finally hit the point where there is no more progression to be done. But uh, as it is, I, I struggle to keep up with, with all of these standards. I think everyone does. Most people haven't got the setup at home, and a lot of developers still don't do it properly. I mean, say, the best thing was with the LFE stuff, we could compress it hugely because there's no high frequencies. So we could just shove out get specific kicks, so we'd have an explosion and a low frequency element the explosion. So the explosion has one type, but we could have 10 different LFE effects, so then we mix them together to get 11 slightly different sounding setups. But we've discovered that a lot of game developers have no clue on how to do it. We would hire people in from the cinema to help us with camera work. Um, was it Richard? Not Richard Joseph. I forgot his name. The guy who did um, the Batman sound design the film. 
we got him in, and he was brilliant. He was so good. And he had that great phrase that I, I used time and time again. To have loud, you must also have quiet. So we had the situation, as I said, with the dynamic range and burnout that we tried very hard. Previously, lots of games, they're just loud. They're always loud. And continually, my game, people come and go, your games are very, very loud. I'm like, a lot of dynamic range. Thank you, I tried very hard just to get that. Um, but out there in the real world, just persuading people to turn up their speakers even a little bit it is, is very, very difficult. And all this new tech is great, but hopefully it all works at a very abstract level. So I'd say play sound effect here, and it goes, all right, this speaker set up, as opposed to what people currently do, which is just shove it out without any sort of training or knowledge. Um, don't worry, it's not all games. Some games do this brilliantly well, and some games they just, they don't. Um, obviously with, um, Got the name of it, Ambersonics. Um, that's one of the, the you know the, the areas of exploration of how to, how do you pan sound when it sounds in the middle. Is it three dB down or is it was it log two n down or is it full volume and so many complicated questions. And at the end of the day, no one cares. That's that's the worst thing. Um, Burnout had very complicated layered music system. My housemate played the game the whole night. Then he went, the guitars get a bit louder than your boost. Like we've, we've sweated blood, we've recorded extra drum lines and an extra lead guitar and we've layered it in and developed a new streaming format that allows us to have interleave channels and yeah, it gets a little louder when you're done, why not, let's just go with that. So people don't pay attention to audio and this was something on Race Driver Grid for the, we had two major features that were brilliant. Um, we had the rewind, so you crash your rewind time and this was just a nothing, I'm like, you know you've invented the, something unique. Let's go to town on this. This is something that's never been done. This is the USP for our whole game. Right, you're like, yes, absolutely. Um, so you could crash and you could rewind the time back. And the other one was, you could choose your name. So they're like, hey DJ, we're gonna have a look. And the reviews loved it. For the first time, everyone's mentioned your name. They'll go, cars sound great. And then you could choose your name and it says your name. It's brilliant. But. With the rewind system, reminds me, being, being right on the internet, I was on a bunch of industry groups and someone said, from the Xbox 360, when I set the pitch to a negative number, the sound must play. How can I play sounds backwards? I went, you can't. They are psychoacoustically compressed. There's no concept of playing an MP3 backwards. It's, it's literally not a thing. And he goes, I've, I've heard games do it. I go, it is not a thing. You can't do it. Race Driver Grid does it. So therefore I can. I'm like, Ah, uh, yeah, you see, I did that game, and the way we did it is we recorded a whole bunch of sounds backwards and played them. So it was just this noise that we played with a bunch of backwards impacts, so you think it's playing it all backwards, but it's really not. And once you get into games, you realise, and something I've had with a lot of the less experienced game designers I've worked with, I'm like, it's all smoke and mirrors, it's all fake. The trick is you don't realise it's fake until you get behind the scenes and you go, all right, you know, that, that fog box, it doesn't exist, it, that's just a sprite. Actually, we, we just fade the black, nothing happens here. It's all smoke and mirrors. The interesting thing about cutscenes is quite often they're mixed out of house. So the cutscenes will go out to Technicolor or or um, hit stop and just go, the cutscene, you do it. So that happens a lot. We're, we're, very, we're very busy. We don't have time to stop doing a lot of cutscenes. So quite often the cutscenes sound great or terrible because they're not done by the same people who've done the game. Um, we had a lot of people join the company or try to join the company coming from a film background, which we considered super easy. An explosion's about to go off. You know it's going off in a film. It's linear. You can go up, duck all the sound down, sound comes out. In black, we did preemptive audio. We tried to predict explosions going off. Um, it was, when we got it right, it was super awesome. There's one point where the sniper's shooting at you and he fires. You hear the crap, and then I know, and I got them to delay the pretend travel of the bullet by a second. So all goes quiet and then the gravestone explodes next to you, but I got to duck all the sound. The people from a film background, they're used to this, and they're like, oh, game audio is easy, I'm like, oh, it's, it's really, really not. But yeah, lots of, lots of film people, trial by fire, you would explain to them the 72 seconds of audio, that's all you get, like, oh, and like I said, you have to reuse all of that, like, you can't, no, no, games must do more than that, 72 seconds, and that's a luxury, like on the PlayStation 1, I mean, not even that. Um, but yeah, we, we ended up uh, interviewing a lot of people in the film industry. But we always looked for passion. It was never, um, oh, I, I could, one of the what, wonderful women on black, Joanna Orland, she, she, it was at, um, 
was a house of flying daggers is a sequence where the lady's blindfolded and she's hearing the sound of the drums and she did that one that's great not that i just went lightsaber brilliant and that's all we need we just need a bit of, a bit of passion there just to say that's what we think is really cool i hope my mum doesn't see this um when i was a younger lad i told a slight fib to my mother and I said, Mom, I really need, need some money. Um, we, we've, we've damaged some stuff and I probably need to get replaced. Like, can I get X on my, on my trust? Like, oh yeah, that's fine. I actually went out and bought some decks and some like, some and all like that. Um, yeah, I, I've carried, I've, I started DJing in about like, 92. I got really good at it. I'm really, really good at it. It is a completely useless skill. Um, utterly useless. But I, you know, I went out, I've got 1210s. I've got a beautiful Citronix mixer. I'm really good at vinyl DJing. I've got CDJs, I've got Pioneer Club Mix, and I'm like, I can't touch it, I can't, I, 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 I can't be bothered to relearn my whole skill. I did a set in Nottingham like, about six years ago, and they said, do you need anything special? I go, no, no, just, just plug tens in the mix, and I'm oh, I think we've got some in storage somewhere, no one, no one uses them anymore. So it was a, it was a kind of a, a bit of a they had a whole bunch of DJs on, just playing anything. The guy before me had CDJs, and then I went on, people were like, this is vinyl. And they were just staring, it's all like, this is real talent, this is real skill, this is... I, I mean, I haven't DJed in ages, I'm not, I'm not taking a good mix here, but I actually had vinyl, I was actually properly doing that. And the stage presence with it, you know, you're touching it, you're, you're flipping the vinyl and out, you, you know, it's great. And the next, the next kids, I'm sure they were very good, pull out a little MacBook Pro like this, and they're squinting it, click, click, you know, play the tune, just stand there for a couple of minutes, and then click, Play, play that one. Whereas I'm, I'm trying my hardest. I can get a beat match in a, you know, five, ten seconds now. Yeah, I'm very quick at it. But I'm not going to stand there for three or four minutes. Just sort of like, I'm crossfade. I'm doing everything I can. And that I have a special hatred for people who pretend to touch the dials. I mean, I've watched a lot of the, um, the, the scratch pervert stuff. You know, the, the DMT championships. Um, I worked on a. <clears throat> I to be careful here. I worked on an unnamed DJ game by Freestyle, who had previously DJ Hero One, DJ Hero Two. Can't say the name of the game because last time I said the name of the game, Activision wrote me a letter saying don't mention this game again. But I'll leave it to your imagination to imagine what perhaps game I am talking about. At that time, I was in charge of two audio programs and twenty DJs. And these guys are insane. Proper high XDMC champions. These are just mind-bogglingly good DJs, like way, way beyond where I can sort of maybe crap and scratch and just a bit like. But these guys are fantastic. But they are they were doing stuff for our game, whatever that game might have been. And they they were brilliant and I, I, I can't remember any of their names because I know their real names because I've worked with them. They were all absolutely fantastic and Freestyle did an incredible job of getting twenty London based DJs who were just amazing. So those guys, those twenty guys. If you work for free time, you're a DJ, you are my best DJs, all 20 of you. I got to the, so I did a, so many games that I got to the point where I actively hated all music. I can sing and I won't. I can sing for you, not only the whole of Justin Bieber's Baby, I can do the rap as well, because it was one of the tunes in our game and I listened to it hundreds of times. Um, we've got, what was it? It was uh, CeeLo Green's Forget You which is the radio version of the title. And one of them was, um, one of the lines was, I'm Xbox, but she's, uh, he's Xbox, but I'm Atari. And we're like, we're gonna struggle to get this through licensing on the Wii. So we got this bizarre scenario that I would listen to music and I had to. So we did a, a game called Skate or Die, and in it, each, each gang of skateboarders had their own unique set of music. And you know, you got the ones that would play Apple Levine, and they got the ones that would play, you know, like classic rock. And then we had the ones that would play, and I, I'm not the expert, I'll say thrash metal, death metal. And we're listening to this, this music, it's just, it's hugely distorted guitar, it's just quadruple time thing, and go going, kill all friends and take And I'm listening to it, and we're going, I genuinely can't tell if this guy roaring about virgins and blood and death is an actual thrash death metal song or whether or not this is a pastiche or a parody of it we genuinely got into this weird realms of i don't i don't understand anymore but because of my job i've had to keep up with music and it's just made me actively hate it apart from i love dubstep because dubstep's new 
And it blows my mind to think that after all this time, after 20 years of everyone with an Amiga on Atari ST cranking out electronic music, someone goes, I've got a new genre of music. And I love the fact that maybe there's another genre of music out there. Uh, and I hope there is. I hope that there's another wave of, of something totally new that just blows everyone away. I mean, I, I'm, I remember I never liked music as a child. Not until I remember the first one. It was on um, a BBC Two show. I forgot the name of it. And they had the prodigies out of space on them. And they went, I, what, what is, I, I really like this. What is it? Who's, I, I, for the first time in my whole life, barring maybe, you know, our friends electric, like, you know, Gary Oldman, going in with the an actor. Um, apart from that, I never really liked any music. And suddenly, bang, breakbeat, breakbeat hardcore. I was like, I love this. This is brilliant. And hopefully that, that happens again. We, we get to listen to it. And hopefully I never have to go back into the games industry proper and start keeping up with pop music for what's in. Burnout 3, Burnout 2 had custom soundtrack. We did all the soundtrack for Burnout 3 and then EA went, no, no, not doing that. Here's your soundtrack. We've got a guy called DJ Stroke. And he's uh, something silly like a, a future music evangelist. And he works out what tunes are going to be popular in nine months' time. And he was so good. I mean, hats off to him. He was a slightly annoying personality in the game. But the music tunes he chose were fantastic. All apart from our, our theme tune, We Are The Lazy Generation, which came and it went. No one knows it, apart from as the burnout thing. So, but yeah, we would have to just sit there all day long listening to music I don't like and critiquing it. That fits, that doesn't fit. I like it, I don't like it. And always the people going, I, I love this song, it's got music and it mentions driving. Like, yes, it's Chris Rea's Road to Hell. And I know it mentions a road, but it doesn't make it suitable for our racing game. Please, can we not put this in? Um, I've always, I've always liked those ones. People say, oh, what's the top three movies? And I'm thinking, uh, I go, if you, like right now, if you said, let's go watch Princess Bride, I'd be like, yeah, right. Um, any of, almost any of the Marvel films, uh, Thor, Ragnarok, and The Last of Avengers, absolutely happy to. Um, probably blasphemous, I wouldn't say Lord of the Rings. I bought Lord of the Rings reasonably recently on Blu-ray. I sat down, watched it all with my friend, all the way through, and I went, I thought there's more extra features than this. I thought there was going to be loads of those special features. And I went, oh, you can buy the non-extended edition. And there's no way I'm watching like 12 hours of film just for the extra 15 minutes. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of the 80s. So I love Alien, Aliens, Terminator, all the sort of the classic films. And like you said, you know, what film do you into? I quite enjoyed the new Terminator film. It wasn't as good as it could have been, but it's better than no Terminator film and people were slagging off the new Star Wars film. I'm like, do you remember the prequels? Do you, have you actually seen them? You've got this fantastic space sequence, and then a bit about trade, and he doesn't have a father, and then some wandering around, and some dialogue, and, and some more stuff. And then it's like, pod race sequence. That pod race sequence is astounding. Beautiful and surround. Because you actually, when you're in, in present view, they've actually put the sound of the engines behind you, and the other sound, sounds great. Um, the new Star Wars event, I really enjoyed them. You know, they weren't perfect, but George Lucas wasn't making any films, so better that he, he puts that out. And you know, a, a reasonable film is better than no film at all. Um, but I mean, genuinely, he, he, that again, I'm assuming you're not spoiling it for anybody. But the bit where Thanos gets hit with a hammer and he goes back to Captain America's house, and the whole we're in England, the whole audience cheers, and we're in England. We don't do that at the cinema. Everyone's like, Wah! And you're like, wonderful, wonderful cinema moment. And yeah, I, I, it's almost it's got really expensive special effects. I come out thinking I've got my money's worth. I saw the Studio Ghibli film, I forgot the name of it. It's very arty, very low frame rate, and very, very simply drawn. I came out going, I feel that should have been cheaper. I, did, I don't feel this was, this was maybe a five million pound film, whereas The Avengers is 300 million, and it's the same, but I want some of the money back until you spend more on special effects, basically. I would tell you what I would consider to be the top three most groundbreaking, not groundbreaking, but most influential games because one of the things I've got accused of is my games aren't original. And I'm like, my games are original. As far as I know, once someone wants to correct me if I'm wrong, please do. The last original game I know was Katamari Damacy. So that was the first game, it was a collector mark. Since then, every game I can trace it back, all the way back to another game. 
And one of the ones that blows my mind, the diff, the, the one of the sort of the watershed moments of gaming history was Wipeout. Before Wipeout, gaming was not cool. Gaming was for nerds and losers and freaks. And then suddenly, you could come back from the pub and pop it. What's this? What, what's it? PlayStation? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's games got Left Field, it's got Prodigy, it's got, uh, you know, Crystal Magic. Like, it had all of the cool music, and suddenly, game almost overnight went from a, 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 a loser's pastime to a very cool pastime. And now, it's mainstream. I mean, there were billboards for Doom Eternal everywhere. It's not. A, a, a shameful hobby anymore. That's that's now Warhammer. Now computer gaming is the cool thing to do, and I love that. My niece and my nephew are growing up, and my niece she loves Fortnite. I have a Fortnite with her. My nephew loves Apex, and we get destroyed with that constantly. I'm trying to get to play Rocket League, which is a little bit easier, um, so we can uh, play that. 